Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Soul Rising podcast. We are all in on love, loss, and connection here. Welcome back. So glad that you've decided to join me and my wonderful guests for another episode. Today, I have um, Betsy Papini. I meant to ask you how you pronounce your last name. Is it Papini? Papini. Oh, Papini. Papini. Okay, cool. I'm I'm Italian, too. I I always like to throw the E's on the end. So (laughs) Betsy Papini. She's a serial entrepreneur in real estate amazing accomplishments. Her brokerage, Peen Realty, has been named as an Inc. 5000 fastest growing private company in the U.S. multiple times and has earned spots on the top 50 Florida companies to watch and Florida trend best companies to work for lists. The Wall Street Journal has consistently recognized Betsy's real estate team as one of the top producing real estate companies in the U.S. She's endorsed by Barbara Corcoran, also other leading uh, media personalities, David Ramsey and Glenn Beck. And um, Betsy started a nonprofit, and she's also the author of an amazing memoir. And I'm so glad to have you here today, Betsy. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. So excited to be here. It's great to have you. Um, So can you tell us a little bit about your book? It's Breaking Boxes, Dismantling the Metaphorical Boxes That Bind Us. That sounds very interesting. How did you you come up with this idea? What is this about? The idea came up in my, I'm 55 years old. And when I was in my mid to late 40s, I was feeling a bit unsettled in my life and not happy. And it took me a year or so to even admit that to myself, that mm-hmm. um, that I wasn't happy and that, that I honestly, that I had the right to be unhappy. I felt that for a while that, like on paper, my life looks good. And I know that a lot of people are so um, not as blessed as I have been. And so I struggled with even being okay accepting the fact that I wasn't happy, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah. So it took me about a year to even admit that to myself. During that year, I was scrolling on the internet and I came across a picture of this girl who is looks to be about four years old. She's in a one piece bathing suit. She's on her lawn, lush green grass. Her, her legs and her arms are spread out as wide as can be. She's got this giant smile on her face, rain pouring down on her head and this look of just pure unbridled joy. And across the, the middle of the picture, it says, remember her, she's still there inside you waiting. Let's go get her. And I was so drawn to her. I printed her out, had sent it to a canvas company. They put it on canvas for me. It hangs in my office at home, hangs in my office at work. It's my screensaver on my phone. It's the computer screensaver. I wanted her everywhere. And, um, about a year later, I live in Florida and we have hurricanes. And so it was hurricane season. We were hunkering down and I always try to have a project because invariably the electricity goes out and, and there's nothing to do. So for this particular hurricane, I had decided that I was going to be putting photos that I had accumulated in boxes into photo albums. And mm-hmm. three hours into the storm, the lights go out. I light my candles. I get out my photo boxes and I start putting these photos into albums. And a couple hours of later, I'm, I'm throwing the boxes away, the photo boxes away. And as I'm throwing the last box away, I see a photo at the bottom of the box. And I, I turn it over to see what it is. I can't see it. Right over to the candle, see what, what this picture is. And it was like a bolt of lightning had gone through me. And it was not from the storm outside. I <laughs> run down the hall with the candle, with that photo in hand. And I... I take it and put it up to this photo that sits on my wall. And then I look back on the photo in my hand and the photo in my hand is a picture of this little girl in her favorite one piece striped bathing suit in the ocean, about three feet in front of her father, who's taking her picture and she's plunging towards a wave as though she's trying to hug it. And she has this smile on her face of pure unbridled joy. And on the bottom of that photo is in black faded handwriting of my mother's, it says, Betsy, aged four. And I thought to myself, this is what I'm missing. Somehow I have, I have lost her along the way. And in my journey of checking off all the boxes that I thought were what it means to be successful in work and life, I somehow missed the boat. Mm-hmm. And so the next several years, and, and I, to this day, am still on this journey, of returning to that four-year-old self and um, going back to who I used to be. And I, it was a process of 
journaling, which I've always journaled, but a lot of journaling, meditation, yoga, therapy for the first time in my life, which involved EMDR, bioenergetic work. I've done channeling, all these different modalities to open myself up to um, how I lost my way. And the, the theme that kept coming back through this process was when I feel lost and most not like myself is when I feel confined by boxes that I feel that I'm in. You know, in real estate, I deal with boxes every day. We use them to pack up customers' wares and ship them across the city, state, or country. We forget that they are supposed to be broken down, flattened, and taken to the curb for garbage pickup day. They're temporary. I tend to hunker down in boxes <laughs> and overstay my welcome in yeah. boxes that maybe had served me at some point in my life or through some crisis yeah. or something, but they no longer serve me and I fail to see that. Or they never serve me and I put myself in them or my my gender, my religion, my family of origin, my industry put my put me in. Um and it's not to say, I'm not saying all boxes are bad. You know, I'm a mom. I will never, ever be exited mm -hmm. from that box. Like I, that is the most precious box I'm in. Um, but there are other boxes that can be destructive. Um, and so the book is a memoir, thematic memoir about my journey of uncovering these boxes Sometimes I don't even know I'm in them. Sometimes I know I'm in them and choose to stay. And now more often than not, I exit when I know my time has expired in the box. And I, my goal in writing the book was really just to help one woman. If one woman, and it's men too. Men are put in boxes just as, as much as, as women are. But I'm a female. I think females might relate to some of my stories more than males. But just if one woman or reader read something and thinks about their life a little bit differently and maybe motivates them to make a change and makes them feel more authentic and live um, a more filling life, then it will have been worthwhile. So that's my book. I say the same thing about my book. You know, it's a labor of love and it was healing for me. I'm sure it was a healing journey for you as you went through it. But you know, if one person gets something out of it, or if a few people read it and then take one little tidbit from it, then it was, it's all worth it, yeah. 100%. So could you tell us about some of these boxes? What were some of the boxes that you were in that you didn't like, that maybe you felt yourself trapped in? Mm -hmm. So I know you said the mom box, that, that's a great box to be in, but did that mom box come with other... Mm -hmm. Um, limitations maybe, or judgments on yourself, or can you tell us just a little bit more about the boxes? Yeah. So like the mom box is a great one and there's being in the mom box, but then there's being in the good mom box and, you know, what, what society deems as a good mom or, or being in the single mom, I'm a single mom. My, my girls were one and two when my marriage exploded. Wow. Uh, so those are boxes that I didn't even recognize until I you don't even know about them until you find yourself in them. Yeah. Um, in terms of the good mom box, like I was, I took a three months of training to leave and I was married at the time. And even when I went back to work, I got a lot of criticism because I was in a, in a group of women that did not work in my neighborhood. And a lot of criticism, they're like, oh, I would never choose my career over my child. And, no. and I was just shocked. I, I never looked at those choices as being mutually exclusive. It was to me a Venn diagram and they overlap, mm -hmm. but there's women that, that don't view that. And that was upsetting, but like the good mom box I struggled with because, um, I remember early on, my, my one daughter, my older daughter was in first grade. And prior to this, I was probably the quintessential helicopter mom. I knew about every single thing that was due. I quizzed my girls. I was doing flashcards when they were still in the wound, you know, I wanted, wanted them to have this great jumpstart. And I think I probably overdid it. And then I remember one day my daughter had a project and you had to do a poster. It was her first real project at school. And so we went to Michael's, we went to the craft store, we got the poster board. I laid out, you know, drew little lines on the poster board so she could write the title straight across and I would, I would put the glue down and say, okay, hold the picture, stick it here. And I mean, it looked beautiful, but I, I orchestrated the whole thing. Yeah. And yeah. 
I took it into I took it into school that morning because I didn't want Maria to wrinkle it. And as we're going into school, I see all the other her classmates bringing in these poster boards. They're torn, ripped, rolled up, yeah. handwriting going down a mountain, you know. And I remember thinking, oh my goodness, yeah. why would their moms let them bring this poster in? You know, why didn't they look at it before they turned it in? Then I saw these kids lining up in front of Mrs. Walton, who was the teacher, and their smiles, they were they were beaming. They were so proud. This was the first project they had, they had been assigned. And they were so proud to show Mrs. Walton what they had done. And I felt so bad. You know, Maria wasn't proud of her work. Maria didn't do the work. And I walked back to my car and I was like, oh my gosh, here I am trying to be what I thought was a good mom. And what was I doing? You know, what, in, in, in the bigger picture, what was my goal here that Mrs. Walton thought I was involved and, and I think I overcompensated because I was a working single mom and, and I didn't want her to look at Maria any differently. And so I, you know, she presented this, this thing looked like a high schooler did it, you know? I mean, but when I sat back and I said, if the long-term goal for me as a parent was to, to have happy, independent, self-confident children, my behavior should for not matching that goal at all. And I stopped cold turkey that night. I mean, I literally stopped everything. Prior to that, if they had left their, their lunches on the counter at home, I would run into school. If they missed their homework, I would run into school. So I stopped everything because I said, I want them to be independent. I want them to be self-confident. So I remember um, when, one day soon after, the nurse, school nurse calls me and said, hey, if you know Maria's left her lunch on the, on, at home, can you bring one in? And I said, I'm sorry. I said, I can't do that. And I felt awful. I felt awful. But I knew in my heart, and I know not all moms would do this, but for me, I knew that the natural consequence of leaving your lunch at home is you don't eat lunch. And I knew if I continued to bring the school lunch, the lunch would continue to be left on the counter at home. So it only took once. And then she never forgot her lunch again. But it was so hard for me. And the school nurse judged me for that. I mean, I lived in really? school. I could have easily run it. And I got a lot of flack from parents in the coming years because I was pretty hard school about it. I didn't bend. I remember I called my my daughter um, was turning in homework late because I went and ran to school. And she would keep getting A's on her math homework. I'm like, how are you getting an A? You're turning it in late. So I finally called the school. I said, Mrs. Smith, why are you sending home A's? She's like, well, it doesn't happen often. I said, you cannot continue to get A's to, to homework that's being brought in late. What lesson are we teaching her? So, mm, but yes. again, I was judged for that, but I was okay with that. In my mind, my definition of being a good mom changed because I had this longer term perspective of what I wanted my children to be as an adult. My favorite sayings to them after that point with Mrs. Walton was, they'd ask me something and I would always say, I don't know, but you'll figure it out. My girls are now 25 and 26. And a couple of years ago, one of them called me and, and they were discussing an issue they had. And I said, gosh, what are you going to do? And she's like, I don't know long, but I'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. and this was It was so <laughs> validating that even though I, I did suffer feeling like I wasn't in the good mom box, that that my goals were met in the long term. So that's that's just an example of of how we judge people, regardless of what they're doing. But in our minds, we each have a certain definition of what a good parent, a good mom, a good dad does, um, and how that can be hurtful, limiting, confining in some way. Another one for me was it's still it's being the good daughter. In my family of origin, there was the expectation that we would be physicians. And my dad's a physician. I grew up working in, in a hospital that he still works at to this day. Both of my, I have a twin sister. I have an older sister. They're physicians. They married physicians. I was pre-med. We were all pre-med. We all went to the same college. We all were following my dad's footsteps. And junior year, I'm like, I can't, I can't keep doing this. I, I don't want to be a physician. And um, that was a huge 
huge decision for me because I knew that was making a huge statement in my family. If, if you don't want to be a physician in my family, and you, the, the choices were physician, attorney, and then if you didn't want to be one of those, you could be an engineer. And I wanted to go into business and they didn't know anybody in business. That was, you know, a pipe dream. I'm now considered the black sheep in the family. And I, I think if they recognized how harmful that was for me growing up, but I still feel like I'm not a part of the central family because I'm not in medicine. Um, and what that can do to somebody, something so innocent as that can really have long-term consequences for people. And it's not all, these are not, my stories are not all boxes that other people have put me in. We put ourselves in these boxes. We put other people in boxes. You know, it's a universal thing. As humans, we have to start categorizing people. We we did that in the hunter and gatherer days because we had to know who was good and who was bad to survive. Yeah. But with boxes come labels and with labels come stereotypes and things that can be very confining and limiting to people. Yes, definitely. And going back to the mom thing, I actually just saw something just this morning. It's funny that you say that. I was on a uh, call for, to learn about motivational interviewing. And if you showed a video of... Um, a mother doing something for like her child, like her child had some kind of problem. I couldn't figure out a puzzle or whatever. And like the mother comes over and puts the puzzle together. And it's like, well, you just took that learning opportunity away from that child mm -hmm. because we're, we automatically go into the fix it mm -hmm. mode you know, or the control mode, or I don't want my child to have to suffer at all. So I commend you for doing the love and logic. Right. Do you know about love and logic? No. Love and Logic is a program that says exactly what you, what you did, that that's what we're supposed to do. They give the example of like, if you have a child who won't put a jacket on. So people typically with willful children or determined children, or parents who struggle, they turn to this Love and Logic. So the example is like the child won't put on a jacket and it's freezing out, you know, and you're fighting with your kid, put your jacket on, put your jacket on. They're like, no, I don't want you. They're like, let the kid not wear the jacket because they're going to be cold, right? Or they're going to be hungry without their lunch. Right. And then the next time exactly. they're going to wear their jacket right. or, <laughs> or they're going to bring their lunch. Right. So natural consequences that are not harmful, right? right? That are safe. Right. Like a child can go a day without eating a lunch. Right. It's not like they're starving, you know? <laughs> so that to me is the harder stuff than this mothering idea that we have of the helicopter, right? Of like always having to be there and always do it because maybe we're afraid that we're going to be judged as being a bad mom, mm -hmm. if, right? Now, I don't know when that changed because I think generations ago, they didn't, you know, I agree. spoon us like they did, like we do now. I know. And I think it turned into a lot of, it's about us. Mm -hmm. It's not really about what's best for our kid. Right. We're doing it because of the optics. Right. No, of I, what, right? How it's going to make us look. Right. No, I agree. I I, I I, I worried how Mrs. Walton was going to view me, you know? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think the other thing that when we do these things for our children, we subconsciously are sending them the message that we aren't confident that they can do it themselves. That's not a message that I think any mom would want to send their child intentionally. No, that's probably the, one of the most destructive messages that is killing right. self-worth, that's killing confidence, mm -hmm. that's disempowering them. Right. Saying, I don't think you can do this. Right. Right. <clears throat> and what is a child here? My mommy doesn't believe in me, mm -hmm. which then probably goes to my mommy doesn't think I'm good enough or doesn't love me. Yeah. That's yeah. how kids, they interpret things like that. Right? right. So making them do those uncomfortable things, right? They're suffering those now. They have that book, Love and Logic actually uses those words, natural consequences. Okay. One of those that, you used, that you used. And it, so it makes total sense. And I'm really glad to hear that both of your daughters are doing well. Mm -hmm. I'm, all, I'm always so curious about like the long-term <laughs> studies, you know, like how did that actually work out? Did they become autonomous, yeah. independent, self-sufficient yeah. women? And I'm sure they have. Yeah, they are they both, have. right? Yeah. That's, that's wonderful. Yeah. And then the box about having to do what the family wants you to do. I remember when I left my job in Manhattan, I was telling Betsy before the show for our listeners um, that I also worked in high-end real estate right when I got out of college. And when I decided to leave that job and go get my master's in social work, my parents were not happy. And I understand now more than ever probably that they had my best intention yeah. at heart, right? It was a lucrative job. You know, I was 26 years old. I was making a lot of money. I had a really bright, uh, rich, you know, life op opportunity. Like I could have gone down that path, you know, but a salesperson, yada, yada. And, um, 
And I chose not to do that. And I chose to go back to social work school and they could not understand why. Mm -hmm. They were really upset that I was making that choice. I really took a risk, a leap of faith. My life turned out just fine. I didn't have to go down that route to be comfortable. But I relate to what you're saying. It makes you feel like, almost like the love is conditional Mm -hmm. a little bit. Like if you don't do what we think you should do or live the way that we think you should live, then we're going to maybe withhold or we're going to maybe, you know, make you feel Mm -hmm. like you're not part of the central. But I really love how you talked about to not blame anybody because that's not my intention. My parents just wanted the best for me. And I probably took it down this rabbit hole based on past history or past messages I got in childhood that led me to believe well, now they're going to love me less right. because I'm not getting their approval, right. basically. Right. But they've always loved me. Right. You know? So. Right. I think another box for me is um, being the single box. Now that I'm single, I've been single for since I was 32. It's so interesting for me. Like, you don't, you can't even experience these boxes until you have the experience. I was recently single and I went to a physician's office for uh, an appointment. And you had to update your health form and it was named, date of birth, all that week. And then it was marital status. And there was four check boxes and it was single, married, divorced, and widowed. So that's a question I had answered hundreds of times prior to this. No problems answering that question. And I stopped dead in my tracks when I read that question. And I physically felt utterly offended that they're asking me this question. I had just gone through the most difficult year and a half of my life. And they want me to just check a box as though that encapsulated what I had just been through. I knew the minute I checked whatever box I chose to check, the minute I checked one, whoever was reading that form was going to make some assumptions based on that box and put some label on me that I didn't want I didn't want to own. And then I was like, why, why do they need to know if I've ever been in a relationship that I deemed serious enough to take it to the courthouse steps to get its stamp of approval? Why would a physician need to know that to give me a pap smear? (laughs) Yeah. Right. So I didn't check anything. And and, and, and sure enough, I got a pap smear. They don't need to know that. (laughs) Uh Right. And then it's like, at what point? Do I become single again? You know, I had just been recently divorced, but now, now I'm 55. I've only been married nine years of my entire life. Am I, mm-hmm. am I single or am I divorced? <laughs> it's an interesting question. And it's the more I see these boxes, like they're all around us. And then we're going to start asking ourselves, why do we care? What, what information? Ask me if, you know, sometimes in the female uh, OBG offices, they ask you that because they think you might be getting abused and they want to make sure that you're in a, you know, relation, you know, they'll ask you questions about that. But so ask me that. Don't ask me if I'm married or divorced, right? Like, I don't know Mm -hmm. what information that's giving them that is critical to any kind of thing that I was there for and totally irrelevant. And now being single for a longer time, you're not single, are you? No, I'm married. So I'm 55 and single. And I probably get asked at least once a week if I'm dating somebody which I find interesting. I don't know why that's such an interest. I mean, I don't know if that also happens to men, single men, maybe it does. But what I find even more interesting is that if I'm not dating somebody at the time that's that's being asked, it's like, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, you know, I know it's so hard. Let me think about who I could set you up with. It's this condition that they feel needs fixed. And, yes. and I haven't said anything. I, I have not suggested in any way that I am unhappy, but there is a notion that that is not okay. I've never been happier. So I, it's so interesting to me, this, this box that we're putting, and maybe, maybe I would imagine single men are also in the same box, but that's been an interesting box for me to experience. Yeah, I think it probably goes to, you know, use the word condition. We're breaking out of not just our personal boxes, we're breaking out of societal, major societal shifts are happening right now. So we're breaking out of those boxes. And I think that box is probably related to, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s housewives, right? If you weren't married back in the day, 
well, like a spinster, right. right? Is that what they call us? Yeah. Is that, is that what we're saying? Yeah. And it was a derogatory term. Right. You know, you were like the cat lady. Right. You were, there was something wrong with you right. that no man wanted to marry you and be that you didn't right. internally have this motivation, right. this intrinsic motivation to couple up right. and have children yeah. that too. I mean, I have women friends that are in their forties that are choose not to have children. <laughs> I think that's great. Mm-hmm. I think not everybody should have a child. Yeah. I think if you know yourself and not everybody should be in a relationship or wants to be. Mm-hmm. It's so great that people like you are like, and women all over the place are feeling like me, are feeling like ruffled, mm-hmm. like our feathers are ruffled by these, mm-hmm. by these questions mm-hmm. because we're waking up mm-hmm. and we're saying like, no more. Right. Like you don't need to know. The only thing I could think of with the OBGYN is if you're single and you're pre- pregnant, maybe yeah. they might want to offer you some services. They might want to say, hey, do you need a, l- a little help or whatever? That's the only thing that I could possibly think. But if you're going in for a general patch, right. you know, I mean, unless they're using that information for like long-term research, because they do have research showing that companionship later in life, you know, helps with health or I don't know, mm-hmm. some, something like that. Mm-hmm. But is it because of that judgment that's put on us, that stigma that's put on us, yeah. that we start to internalize yeah. what the outside world is telling us and then our health deteriorates if we're right. single? Now we're in a world, we're living in a time where, you know, the feminist movement, I mean, like we're being encouraged yeah. to be on our own, to be independent, yeah. to not need that that man. That man should compliment, mm-hmm. right? Well, that woman, whoever you partner with, yeah. should compliment you. Right. It should be because I'm feeling pressured right. that that's the societal norm. Exactly. So if I'm understanding correctly, it feels like your book is giving people the opportunity and the permission. Yeah. Huh? The permission right. to not put themselves in these boxes that we think we're supposed to be in because those could be extremely detrimental. Mm-hmm. If you're not living your truth mm-hmm. because you feel pressured mm-hmm. to do something because society wants you to or your family wants you to or you put it on yourself that you should do that, yeah. that's going to be detrimental to your health and well-being. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. obviously, right? If you're living like that, you can be depressed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not going to be good. So you've told me about this feelings wheel that you carry around. Is this like a way to identify like when you are in a box, when you've put yourself in a box? In my family of origin, we didn't talk about feelings. It was always, what do you think? What do the facts tell you? I was never asked, Betsy, how do you feel? And yeah, a generational thing too. Yeah. yeah I don't think a lot of us in our yeah. 40s, 50s were. The only messaging on feelings I think I got was they're fleeting, they're unreliable. In terms of feelings and emotions. So mm-hmm. um, when I was doing all this journaling and therapy, it all went back to, okay, well, how does this make you feel? And recognizing that my body knows before I can, I rationally know. Yes. And that's been very, I mean, I'm sure a lot of, I'm, I feel like I'm in kindergarten in this subject because it just wasn't something that I, I um, learned growing up. So getting in tune with how my body is feeling. So I have this feelings wheel. It's like a color wheel and it, Mm-hmm. And pick what feeling is very basic. I remember when I first went to therapy, she said, how do you feel? I said, good. She said, well, what other feelings do you feel sometimes? I said, well, sometimes I feel bad. And she's like, well, what other emotions do you feel? And I'm like, well, those are, those are it. And I didn't have the vocabulary. I went to yeah. Brene Brown's Atlas of the Heart. And it's like this dictionary. Uh-huh. It was opening up this whole for me. So this helps me. So like, you know, the, the main ones, the main six emotions, fear, love, joy, surprise, sadness, anger. And then it drills down to the nuances of each of those and really hones in on what you might be feeling. And so I carry that around with me. And then I also have an app called How We Feel. It's a wonderful app. It's a free app. And it checks in with me. I think I have it set for six times a day and it'll vibrate. And then you check in and it tells you, it gives you all these, like literally a hundred different emotions. You can click on it what emotion you're feeling. And then it asks you, who are you with? What are you doing? And notes. So it's wonderful because you start seeing these patterns of when you're mm-hmm. feeling out of sync and disconnected and how you can get yourself back in alignment. So that's been a wonderful tool for me to help me feel more centered um, in my body. Can you tell us the name of that app again? It's called How We Feel. How We How We Feel. How we feel. It's, okay. Yeah, it's wonderful. And free. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like that. So I do that as a check-in. Kind of like meditation. It's just a practice that keeps me more mindful. And I simply just try to move towards 
that which makes me feel lighter and happy and move away from that which makes me feel heavy down. And it really, it's very nice because I used to think, well, well, what should I do? Like what, not, I hate that word should, but like, what are the facts? Yeah, I was always going back to facts and, uh-huh. and now I really am learning to trust. It, that's been hard. Trust my body and trust what uh-huh. my body is telling me. So it sounds like looking, um, looking for external factors to indicate how we're supposed to feel. Mm-hmm. So like this happened and this happened and maybe this person said this or reacted that way and now I'm going to feel this way. Yeah. Like it was all very pat, right? The answer, it was all very like this happens and then this A plus B equals C type of deal, right? right? Um, that's just not how it works. Right. And I think that's all part of our liberation as well, just as a human species, mm-hmm. like all this this enlightenment period that we're in is all about this feeling into our bodies. I'm glad you brought up the somatic practices mm-hmm. because I'm kind of a newbie. I've known about it for a long time, but I've been venturing more into breath work mm-hmm. and I'm going to become EFT tapping certified. And my husband's done EMDR and we've done hypnotherapy. So like right. um, it's the answer because the trauma that I, you know, I, I don't, I don't care what anybody says, you know, the way that children were parented in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s was traumatic. Okay. It was okay to, you know, there's still cultural norms. It was the norms. It was just how it was. <laughs> Again, no no blame. You said something like you weren't asked about how your feelings were or something else. Like, it just wasn't a thing. <laughs> it's just, not, just ha- not how it was done. But it's left a mark on us. Yeah. So we know now to do things differently, but for people in our generation and above and below probably, I, I, especially above, have this stuff stored in our body. <laughs> And it's only through the somatic work that it's going to be released. We can't think our way out of trauma. Yeah. It doesn't doesn't work. We're finally learning that. We're finally acknowledging that and saying, you know what? I could sit in a therapist chair for 20 years and I could still be triggered and I could still be feeling fearful and anxious and depressed and all this yeah. because it has to be healed in the brain. And that's what all that somatic work does. So can you tell us a little bit more about your, uh, maybe your EMDR work or maybe even your inner child work is very interesting to me. The inner child work I've just done on my own through different books, but the EMDR I do with the therapist, that's been very interesting. Numerous sessions, she picks topics that are very, that are traumatic for me and still traumatic for me, even though they happened sometimes 20, 30 years ago. You've done it in EMDR? Were you... No, my husband has. Okay. I mean, it's very simple. You're just holding two apparatuses in your hand and you're watching this light go back and forth. It's supposedly rewiring. They say it's similar to the process that happens in one stage of your sleep cycle, but it rewires how you're thinking about certain things so that they no longer have the triggering impact. I feel like it's worked. I don't know how it works. It doesn't make sense. Like what I think, you know, using my thinking brain, I'm like, I don't see why this would work, but it does seem to lessen those triggers for me. So in fact, I'm going in a half an hour to do another session. So oh, good. Yeah. So that's been great. The bioenergetics work was very interesting. Have you done that work? Well, I don't know. I don't know. What, what, what is it? I might have and just haven't called it that. Well, we went, it was an all day workshop where we went to a farm and you don't know any of these people. And um, it was just really getting in touch with how your body's feeling. I don't think I'd ever been that vulnerable in my life. I mean, the first exercise you're standing in a circle. You don't know these people. You've said very little to them at the beginning. And you do all these exercises throughout the day. One of them is you stand in the circle and somebody gets in the center of the circle and they face you. So the person in the center is facing you and you're looking at them. And you're only about two to three feet away, whatever your distance is that you're comfortable with, you know, your personal space. So you're fairly close to them. And again, you're not saying anything to them, but you can't, you cannot stop eye contact. You you have to have 100% eye contact with this person. Then the person that you're looking at has to follow your breathing, your deep breathing. So once you guys are in sync with deep breathing, me, never looking away from them eye to eye, mm-hmm. then mm-hmm. once the person in the center feels safe, all they say is, hi, I'm Betsy. That's all they do. And then they, they continue to sink their breasts Again, not looking away. The other person cannot respond to you. And when you feel comfortable, you go to the next person. There were people bawling doing this. I mean, it was so, it's hard to explain how difficult it was. 
you realize how little you actually have eye to eye contact with somebody for two to three minutes. Not you don't break eye contact with a stranger. You left that exercise without having said one word, feeling like you knew these people more than you knew some of your friends because of the intimacy that's involved when it's just the two of you in this space, sinking your breath and having this eye contact. I would highly encourage anyone to look into it. It's very interesting if you need to get back into how you're feeling. So there's lots of different exercises like that. We did one where we got into triad. Then again, very little talking. You don't talk at all, but so you you hold one person's hand, then you hold the other, and you look. You always have this eye contact. You had eye contact with people the entire day, and it's how did you feel when somebody took your hand versus how did you feel when your hand wasn't chosen, and working through all those emotions and those and those feelings that came up were the same feelings that we feel in our everyday relationships, but getting you to feel them so intensely and then debriefing on them afterwards was just incredible. Turns out I have done something similar. Okay. Thank you for, thank you for explaining that. I went to a women's circle um, here. I live in Castle Rock, Colorado, and there's a yoga studio that does uh, women's circles every now and then. And I went to my first, my first one, which was the first one I've ever done. Perfect. And they did an exercise like that. And me and this other woman, this stranger who I'd never met, just met that night, had to stare at each other's eyes for five minutes and not look away. And I know exactly how you felt in that moment because it is one of the most extremely vulnerable. We both started crying. Yeah. And it was so interesting because it was like, because you could read through people's eyes, like you could feel into like their soul, right? So it's getting you on this other level with this other quote unquote stranger who is not, like you said, is not a stranger by the end of it. <laughs> and, and it felt like I was almost holding her mm-hmm. or holding space for her. Like I could feel her pain first, just in what her eyes looked like. Yeah. And I kind of, I'm very empathetic and I can feel people's energy very easily. Mm-hmm. So I did that for her. And then about halfway through, it switched. Mm-hmm. And then she, she regained her composure. Mm-hmm. We were still staring at each other. Mm-hmm. And then I stopped crying. Mm-hmm. And I, I can't even tell you exactly what I was crying about. It yeah. was just this real intense, deep connection. Yeah. This can, emotional intimacy yeah. that is like lacking like in our society yeah. big time. The vulnerability, like we're all walking around, all guarded well, sure. up and, you know, protected and all that kind of stuff. So this was like, yes, this was like you're letting the guard down. You're letting somebody read your soul, like look at your eyes and really see your pain because well, that's where we hold it. Right. Like the eyes, right? This is the window to the soul. Right. So that's amazing. That's really cool. I commend you so much for doing this kind of work. It's not easy. This is the hard stuff, mm-hmm. right? We do the hard things. This is, this is the hard stuff. It's the tuning into our bodies and how we feel. And that's not always pleasant, right? Into, that's so funny. I'm laughing about the good and bad. That's it. I have two emotions. I'm good or I'm bad. And those aren't even emotions. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> But that's, you know, where so many of us start. I, I didn't have any of this language growing up, again, because it just wasn't a thing. We weren't sitting around the dinner table talking about emotional intimacy and vulnerability and feelings. Like, it just didn't happen. So this is a big learning curve for so many of us. So you do yoga as well, yeah. meditation. So tell us a little about what your meditation practice looks like. Oh, it's very simple. I just use an app. I rotate between Insight Timer and Mind Valley. And headspace. Those are the three I yeah. kind of rotate through. And at least every night, sometimes I wake up and do it as well. And usually uh, 30 to 60 minute meditation. Okay. Oh, almost every night. You do that every night? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I love that. I think some people feel like it's a chore, but I mean, I, yeah. I to me, that's my treat. Like I look forward to it. Yeah. And it, it's that's great. very calming and centering for me. So, yeah, I, I do it every night. It's fantastic. So I want to go back to your book for a minute. So what does the metaphorical part of the boxes mean? When I think of boxes, like I'm in real estate, I see boxes right every day. They're they're very physical. They're they've got, mm-hmm. they've, got, mm-hmm. they've got walls. They have you're either in or out. They're very physical. So metaphorical for me was more these 
nebulous constructs that seem just as real as the physical boxes. And we are chained to them even more strongly than a physical box, you know, that we could ever be to a physical box. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. they don't exist. They're all in our minds. It's like the elephant chained to a stake, not realizing it can walk away. <laughs> but it, you know, it can easily out outmaneuver that stake, but is so conditioned to stay on that stake. So that's what it meant. Just the the nebulous of these boxes and the dismantling of those structures, even though they're not physical. And what do you think makes us stay in the boxes for so long? I think a combination of things. Um, Lack of awareness. I think there's people who don't even know that they're in a box, that there's a box that exists, that there's choices outside the box. I think it's comfort. I mean, boxes are incredibly comforting. It's It's funny, as much as I, there are aspects of of my family of origin, the box that I felt that I don't like, like the minute my marriage imploded, I moved home. I moved and I, I moved back into my childhood bedroom and my children moved into my sister's bedrooms down the hallway that I grew up, the house I grew up in. I fled right back to that box because it was a box of safety and security for me. So I think that is it it's it becomes very comforting and until the pain of staying is greater than the pain of leaving they're going to stay yeah. um and then i think there's fear i think there's fear of loss fear of loss of status you know the good mom status whatever status loss of we're social creatures loss of our social network people mm-hmm. you know, us and then Fear of a loss of financial security. When I went into real estate, that was a huge thing. I, I left a very well-paying job uh-huh. to go into real estate and it took me a long time because I, I, I did worry about my financial security. So I think fear would be the third reason why we stay in boxes. Uh, as you were speaking, this quote came to me. It's by um, a nice nin. And it's, and the day came when the risk to remain tight in a bud was more painful than the risk it took to blossom. And that I feel like kind of sums mm-hmm. up what you're talking about, mm-hmm. that it feels comfortable until it doesn't anymore, mm-hmm. but there's still all this fear of stepping out of this box. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if you could give our listeners like one tip, like your best tip on how to start that process of breaking down their box. I mean, obviously first they have to know they're in the box, right? And then understanding the options. What I what helps me is visualizing, role playing in my head, me out of the box. How does that feel, and who is it going to impact? And walking through that conversation, if there needs to be a conversation, or even if it's not a conversation, but you understand the implications of you removing yourself from a box, the losses you may be experiencing, living it in your body, being okay with that. So I always like to say, worst case scenario. This, this could happen and and feel it. And it's like, okay, Betsy, are you okay with that? And 99 price of 1100 I am. I, I, I am fine with it. But it's, if I don't actually think about what the worst case scenario is, it blows up in your head as, oh my gosh, this is so scary. But if you actually write down, okay, worst case scenario, this person never talks to me again. Worst case, can I live with that? Most of the time, sadly, but yes, I... I I can, I don't want that, I don't wish that, but if they're only talking to me because I'm in this box, do I want that friendship if I become my authentic self? Probably not. So yeah. working through what that worst case scenario looks like and internalizing it, being okay with it, gives me the courage to take the first step out. My therapist said something similar to me a long, long time ago. I was telling her I was afraid of doing something and she said, same thing, what's the worst that could happen? Put yourself in that worst case scenario, like you said, and see how are you truly going to show up? Mm-hmm. Most likely you're going to show up for yourself mm-hmm. better, more confident, more self-assured, or you might even show up mm-hmm. scared shitless, mm-hmm. you know, but like you're still going to show up and walk through that thing. So yes, like you're talking about, it's like that assumption, that thing that we do, we just blow mm-hmm. stuff out of proportion, yeah. but getting really a visual, writing it down, mm-hmm. that's great tip. Thank you so much for sharing that because that 
That helps me a lot. I still use that one. Betsy, is there anything? First of all, tell our listeners um, where they can find your book. Sure. So it launches September 23rd. It's It'll be on it in the major bookstores and on the Amazon. Right now, pre-sales are on barnesandnoble.com for hard and softbound copies and Kindle and Audible pre-sales are on Amazon. They can find me on my website, betsypapine.com, which is just my name, and they can sign up for my newsletter there. And it, there's also links to my book on the, my website. And then I'm on all okay. the social media channels. I know you just at Betsy Papine. Okay. Is that you on yeah. social media? Yeah. Okay. For TikTok. Okay. On TikTok, I'm Game Soul Realtor. Okay. <laughs> um, and is there one piece of wisdom, kernel of uh, truth, just something that you want to leave our listeners with? We have a quote wall in my office, and we all submitted our quotes, and we, we had them. I don't know how they did it, but basically they're on our, our wall. And my quote is next. That's my favorite word, just next. What that signifies for me is that, well, one, it's all going to be okay. And I think we overthink things. We we take things so seriously, so um, personally. I believe everything has a lesson, and I tell my agents this all the time. Take the lesson, and then next, move all in. It doesn't mean anything else. Just what was this experience there to teach you? Learn it, internalize it, whatever you need to do with that lesson. And then it's next. It, there's no failure. There's no labeling. It's just you learn something. You know, you step out outside the box. You realize that wasn't the box. You step out, step back in. You learn. You, that was a great learning. There's no failure. Hmm. Just next. Learn and then move on. That's great. Thank you. I'm totally going to take that. I could get very spun up or stuck in places. <laughs> We all care. So that, yeah, that's really great advice. Well, thank you, Betsy. Oh, You've been a lovely guest. Thank you. thank you so much for being on Soul Rising. Yep. And you have later. a wonderful day. Best of luck with the book. I'll definitely put all the information in the show notes for our listeners. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Take care.